So the fire danger rating system, the, the National Fire Danger Rating System, is a response to uh, perceived inadequacies and gaps within the, the current fire danger rating systems that, that are used over most, if not all, of Australia. So we've heard a lot about the, the MacArthur fire danger rating system earlier today, and uh, there's been a lot of good work in, in looking at its forecasts and its predictions of Black Saturday, and they were, they were pretty good, let's, let's face it. Um, but there are aspects of that system that, that just don't work that well. One of them is that the, you know, MacArthur did a lot of work in the dry sclerophyll forests around Canberra to, to develop a forest rating system and did a lot of work on developing the grass system and, and we saw aspects of both of those this morning. Trouble is that forest, dry forest and grass combine add up to something like or something less than probably 25% really, um, of the landscape of Australia. So three quarters of the country isn't really addressed properly by, by either of those rating systems. Yet people have tried to, to squeeze them to shape over regions that, that really shouldn't be. And, and their success has been limited or non-existent in some cases. And as a result of that, uh, it, it's been clear that, that the system needs expanding or, or it to be replaced by a new system. Now, one of the things that, that's important in, in doing that is to, uh, to recognise that the physical structure of the fuels, the stuff that's going to burn, is, is important. So, for example, you know, I, I work in Tasmania um, usually, or as a severe weather meteorologist, uh, when I was doing that, and the and the stark contrast at that start in that context between the button grass moorland fire danger rating system that was developed in the 1990s as a result of the inadequacies perceived in the in the um, application of the <coughs> MacArthur rating system to to that fuel, um, compare that to the forest rating system. They're very very different rating systems because the fuel structure is very, very different and the way it responds to the weather is very, very different. So for example, in the forest, if, um, if you have a couple of millimetres of rain, it doesn't work its way down from the canopy down to the surface and it gets ignored. In the moorland, if you have a couple of millimetres of rain, uh, it sits on the tufts and, and nothing burns until it dries off. But if you have 40 millimetres of rain a week beforehand, in the moorland, it, it sits at the base in the moorland and you can be sloshing around in, in, in the mud or, or indeed water up to here, but the tufts are up above the, that surface and, and it will burn quite happily. But if you have 40 millimetres of rain in the forest, then that's soaked through the canopy and, and everything's a lot wetter. Wind is, is uh, the progress of wind, if you like, is interfered. <clears throat> with by the physical structure of the of the forest, but the, the wind blows over the top of the moorland quite easily, and so even though the forest is very sensitive to wind, moorland is much more sensitive to wind. So those those differences are important in, in the development of of new models for fire behaviour in different fuels. Another aspect of the um, MacArthur system, or one of several aspects that, that we'll touch on later, we'll come back to later, is that there's this inbuilt assumption that it's slightly unstable, that the atmosphere is slightly unstable, because most of the experiments that, that MacArthur did in the early, or late 1950s, early 1960s, were during the afternoon when the atmosphere was, was slightly unstable anyway. He didn't try to light fires on hot, dry, windy days when it was very, very unstable. So the model is, is based on conditions that weren't going to get in jail, basically. Um, so, um, so that's an issue that, that the, the model itself has, that the MacArthur model has. Um, and it's something that people have recognised for a long time and tried to account for by 
things like the, the C. Haynes and its precursor, the, the Haynes Index, um, and, and various other factors. Um, there are a range of other things that the, the current system doesn't even attempt to address that the new system will. So there's been a lot of work done in the last couple of years on the fire behaviour index side of the new system that, um, for which the um, fire agencies and the Bureau have, have developed a daily updating national um, prototype. Um, but there are other aspects that are only really starting to be addressed. So there are, there's a model for um, ignition, uh, for potential suppression, and for impacts. <coughs> there's a lot of research that's been done in the background that's still to be drawn together into this new, uh, this new system. But it's work that, that wasn't even conceived of when the MacArthur system was developed. As good as that system was for the time that it was it was built, it's you know there are there are a number of inadequacies which we have to address with the new system. So that's by way of of if you like broad background. The the prototype system that we've developed over the last couple of years, and, and as I say, that's been run on a daily basis right now, and has been since the um, southern 2017-18 fire season. Is, is built on eight published fuel models or fire behaviour models with eight different fuel types and uh, it includes forest of course, it includes grass, uh, dated models of, of each of those compared to MacArthur but it also includes things like the, the Mallee Heath in northwestern Victoria for example uh, there is a large region of Mallee Heath grass model doesn't work very well, the forest model doesn't work very well. There's a specific model that's been developed over the last decade or two um, for that. Uh, I'm not sure what the proportion is, 50% probably of the continent of Australia with spin effects. Um, and, and over the last decade or so, Neil Burrows in Western Australia has developed a model to account for the behaviour of fire in, in spin effects. <laughs> it works quite differently to, to the, the forest and the grass. The thing about each of those models is that they all hinge on the meteorological inputs one way or another. You know, in one model, uh, one meteorological input might be more important. So, as the wind in the case of, of the moorland that I talked about before, in other cases, other, you know, usually wind is quite important, but uh, in other models, the sensitivity is very depending on the, the, the character of, of, the, of the fuel. So the underpinning message is that, that the weather is very important always, but um, there are other aspects of the weather that are also important that aren't incorporated into those fire behaviour models. Now, the way that some of those things have been addressed so far is by, red, by the use of what, what we're calling red flags. So, uh, for example, um, the, the stability that I, I mentioned briefly before that, that MacArthur doesn't address particularly is incorporated at the moment into the, into the fire danger rating system by the C. Haynes Index that uh, Graham mentioned earlier and that other people uh, pointed to in, in the context of their talks. There's another spotting red flag, so if, if you know, a bunch of calculations indicate that, that spotting is, is a particular problem, or potentially a particular problem, then spotting is a red flag over, over a particular region, and details of how that region is defined I won't go into. Um, and the third one that, that has been incorporated into the fire danger rating system is a wind change danger index uh, again, based on work that, that Graham did um, when he was working at the Bureau. So, you know, there was quite a bit of focus this morning in the in the talks about the significance of the wind change and the fact that the uh, you know for people who haven't got a fire background, the fact that what was your head fire 
um, suddenly became becomes the flank, and what was a very long flank fire suddenly becomes a 40 or 50 or 60 kilometre head fire, uh, which is much more difficult to deal with in, in many respects. Uh, so, so the importance of a wind change can't be underestimated, and that's simply the the uh, the obvious effect. By when you start to incorporate things like uh, the angular bores that um, that Todd talked about, and um, uh, and <coughs> some of the other impacts of having a, a front go through or a wind change go through, the importance of that wind change danger index becomes, uh, or, or some some something like that, uh, becomes fairly clear. So we've got three red flags at the moment, and um, the there's nothing to say we shouldn't have more, but you wouldn't want to have 15 of them, for example. Um, and there are a couple of things that, that potentially are important that have been addressed within the context of the Bushfire Natural Hazard CRC and that have been addressed by research around the world but haven't been incorporated into the system so far. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll get to the thing that I'll talk about very shortly. Um, but the, the thing that we have talked about that I've flagged, I'd like to talk about a little bit more today is, is the Sea Haynes. Um, and as I said, that attempts to incorporate atmospheric stability into the, into the process of identifying bad days. But a lot of people have concerns about the, the Sea Haynes, whether it's the best thing that's available to address uh, aspects of in increased fire activity as, as a function of the, the um, atmospheric profile, or the, the structure of the atmospheric profile. The Sea Haynes, for those people who, who don't know, is, is the way it's um, developed in Australia, is it looks at the dew point depression at 850 hectopascals, about 1,500 metres above the surface, if that's small, then life's easy. If it's big, it means there's a lot of dry air aloft, which can potentially influence the fire activity. Similarly, the difference between 850 and 700 temperatures gives an indication of the of the, you know, the actual instability of the, of the atmosphere. And those two things are combined to be, are, are mashed together, if you like, into this one index. Uh, it, it worked pretty well in, in the 1980s or late 1980s in the Northwest Pacific. May or may not work so well over much of the Australian continent. And so it would be a good thing to chat about that. Maybe we'll, we'll spend 10 or 15 minutes talking about that. And the other thing that I wanted to spend a, a bit of time talking about or, or getting ideas about uh, or mulling over is, is downslope winds. Um, People have recognised that the effect of topography on, on the surface weather and, and fire activity is pretty profound in many cases. Um, it, it wasn't something that, that was particularly talked about this morning, but there's a lot of research that, uh, for example, um, Jeff Keppert's team has done within the context of the Bushfire and Natural Hazard CRC, uh, for example, the um, uh, the effect of the Blue Mountains on the state mine fire in 2013 uh, they showed that the mountain wave activity uh, that occurred as the uh, air mass flowed over the Blue Mountains uh, affected the fire activity quite quite profoundly. Um, other work that the Japanese team have done uh, on for example, the Margaret River fire showed that even quite subtle variations of topography were sufficient to, to mix dry air from above the surface down onto the surface overnight. Um, and, and that caused what had been a, a, a pretty difficult to sustain prescribed burn to become a raging wildfire by the time the, the crews arrived during the morning to try and stoke their fire up to find to their horror that the thing raced off across the countryside. So, you know, say even small atmospheric or small terrain effects are enough to affect the atmosphere. And the other one 
that, that leads immediately to what mine is, is work that Mika did on the Waruna fire, so the uh, airflow off the Perth scarp um, it ended up generating uh, a hydraulic jump that caused an uh, ember storm over, over the town of Yarloop and, and uh, Mika modelled that, that very, in a very detailed fashion and uh, Yarloop ended up with uh, 100 odd homes, I think, destroyed as, that's more or less correct, isn't it? 170 odd Yeah, yeah, so, so pretty devastating. And that, and that was a, uh, one of these downslope wind type effects. So, um, how, how should we incorporate downslope winds into, into a, a fire danger rating system? Um, probably as some sort of, um, red flag, it's, it's difficult to see how, you, how you'd actually tweak the fire behaviour calculations. Um, maybe someone can see how you do that. But it would be interesting to, to get ideas about how that, those atmospheric processes uh, be incorporated into, into the new system. So I'd love to hear your ideas. So, you know, probably talk about maybe do a back pass and then switch over to, to the atmospheric stability, I think. Um, and reflection. But it is kind of the easy one to deal with. Well, just clarify, the, 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 what we're looking at with the fire behaviour index is um, across all the vegetation types, ultimately that will be what drives the rating. Mm -hmm. uh, but as a placeholder, until we find a way to incorporate these things like our slope winds, we've got the red flags. But the ultimate goal is to ultimately get someone to build them into the fire behaviour model so that, that these factors that we know affect fire behaviour are actually properly expressed within it. So, mm. um, it, it, I, I see those red flags as an interim step to eventually driving the research to getting those into the... the, the yeah, and, and look, you know, ultimately if, if, if we have, you know, a 400 metre model running across the country, um, <coughs> 10 years down, um, then you could argue that by that stage, downslope type winds will be incorporated into the into the dynamical model. They'll, they'll pop out naturally at, at quite fine scales. But yeah, uh, until we until we reach that point, then um, uh, we should be flagging them as a separate thing. And, and even if we get to the point where they they are explicitly modelled at, at high resolution, you know, maybe it's not a bad thing to to flag the, the fact that you know the reason the fire danger is so high here is because of the downslope wind that, that's happening because of the upstream topography. And the, I, I think there's value in, in both things. But yeah, certainly um, that you know the ultimate goal is is to build something that that just naturally incorporates many of these effects. But we're, we're some way away from that yet. Um, any thoughts? Kevin? If you can't model the downslope winds now, from what you're saying, how can you give a red flag warning? If you can model the downslope winds, why aren't they incorporated into the fire behaviour? I sort of just having trouble reconciling how you're going to give a red flag warning that could be downslope winds based on what and how it's certainly going to be if it hasn't been come out in the modelling process. Are you just going to look for general terrain factors combined with the weather and sort of come up with a best estimate? Is that what you? Well, right, that, that's that's kind of the initial thought, I guess. Um, so there, there's been a lot of work done at individual sites, you know, usually aviation sites, so airports that are in the lee of terrain that are able to identify <coughs> the potential for for downslope wind effects, which affect aviation safety. Um, but when you try to apply that sort of thing across the landscape, it becomes a bit more complicated. You know, you need to um, you need to identify the um, the angle of your terrain relative to the angle of the of the wind flow, and and then incorporate stability uh, effects above the surface. Um, that. You know, people have tried to do that, and, and I've seen some efforts that uh, look promising, and and 
we've talked within the Bureau of trying to use the um, the access C models, which are at 1.5 kilometres, which is pretty spectacular, really, compared to what we had even 15 years ago, um, to, to generate that sort of um, detail. And even if you've, you've managed to model it successfully, um, what do you what do you do to to incorporate that into a red flag? Do you do you simply summarise the uh, the potential over over as we do at the moment the fire weather district so that ten percent or more of the fire weather district may be subject to downslope winds over at least one hour during the day and then put that up as a red flag or is, is there something clever that should be done um, from that uh, um, I think it just highlights that we can't try and <coughs> have a system that is, fits everything and that's why having interpretation and analysis by meteorologists and by behaviourists together and fuels expert is important. You can't you, you can't automate these systems by any stretch of the imagination. That's what I think is, is being highlighted here. So we have the detail, and we saw great presentations on on detail, but at the end of the day, um, you're trying to sort of, a lot of that detail is in the mind of a meteorologist yeah, or yeah. someone like the Tolkis, by the age of the specialist. Um, and then that gets communicated, but um, a fire danger rating system, um, I'm, I, I guess I, I'd like to hear how, what, what, what is the end hope? Is, it, is the end hope that you can automate the system and have it spit out an answer at an indices, which I am completely opposed to, or, um, or is it, I mean, I would have thought it's to complement the work of a fire weather meteorologist and a fire behaviourist rather than trying to, so it's, all, it's, it's too difficult to incorporate everything in such detail until we have um, fire couple models being run and we have the computing power to do that. But uh, yeah, I'm just, can you just say anyone where you've gone with it? Yeah. <laughs> but I'm, the, the, the old name is to reduce the misses and false alarms as fire of rain. And so how do you improve the system so you're accurately setting the rating and you've got your preparedness and community warning drive? And so we know that the current system has a lot of those. And how do we improve it? And, and, and I think that, that that's what we need to look at. So, some of this detail will hopefully give us a, a, a more accurate outcome as far as the rating. And it's as simple as that. So but it, 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 how, how do you incorporate this? It, you know th these new advances in science, so that we can we can better utilise that. that and we can, they're probably complementary aims as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. So for instance, the wind change danger index, which we implemented based on Graham's work in the system we've got at the moment, can be mapped as a flag where it's above the threshold, or even with the individual values, or you can then get down to the hourly winds and, and look at the detail of the, of the change itself. So I think it's it's probably important to have that simple message hey, there's something to look at supported by the detail for the sort of mental picture building that you're talking about. Which is what a fire the meteorologist does, does do. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I just, I guess, yeah, I'm just again looking for a, I'm a little bit confused, that's all, on whether mm. the rating system's trying to move away from indices, which it sounds like it is, it sounds like that's exactly what you're trying to do, you're trying to move away from being too tied to the indices, and that, leads into seeding haynes being mm. used as an embassy. We don't just look at seeding haynes in isolation, we're also looking at neurological diagrams and making an assessment of mixing depth and instability as well and then communicating that. Yeah, and the, and the seeding haynes chart or whatever it is on any particular day. Yeah, it's just it, a it's flag, it's just a point just yeah, 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 it's just yeah. a... Yeah. So, yeah. And I think across the, the program we're starting to recognise that a bit more as well and trying to get away from just a fire danger rating that has to answer all the questions to building in information about emissions, pressure and potential consequences to, to start teasing apart what information you need to support different decisions.
decisions. And then it is a bit better than just a single, a single number. Um, yeah, I think that's just to say what from Stuart and comment and then question. Um, I think it is decision support. Um, I think we are going to end up with indices that people are going to make a call on. Um, sort of, you know, is it above the index when they do one action? Or, I, I, I mean, that's not the end of the story. That's obviously just one um, aggregation of a whole lot of information that, that needs to be much, much richer. I, I don't see that. Actually, what I wanted to go was probabilities. When we first started talking about the National Fire Danger Rating System back you know, in 2010, I think it was, uh, or at least that's when I first got involved, um, we were talking that the system would be fully probabilistic. And I'm just wondering, what is the thinking about that now, either in the prototype or in the future? Is that, is that still part of the thinking? Uh, but it, it is, and uh, Evan is uh, doing some work at the moment on, on teasing out how, how we might actually do that. Um, and um, do you want to talk about it? Yep. So, I mean, the prototype is not probabilistic mm. at all. Um, yeah. It's deterministic. Yeah. It's just. I'd say it's not probabilistic, yeah. Probabilistic, yeah. So, I guess we're in the Bureau, with, with, we're playing around now with the Access City model in ensemble mode and we're looking at Queensland fires that happened in November and the plan is to run the yeah, Access City over the Queensland domain and run it through the National Fire Danger Rating System in a probabilistic mode, um, which could then uh, you could have uh, outputs such as probabilities of different fire danger rating levels. Um, the sort of early stages, I think the elements of the um, NFDRS that could be probabilistic much earlier than other parts, like the wind change mm. rate, right, like the probability of a wind change, or um, you know, could be could move into a probabilistic mode earlier than others. I think the principle of being using probabilities is a good one because even from a probabilistic a PDF, you can produce a deterministic uh, answer and different customers, different users will need, some, some people need probability, others need a, a single answer for different decisions that need to be made. So uh, wherever possible, I think we need to be moving to probably as soon as possible. And, and I guess with the access models, um, or the probabilistic versions, the ensemble versions of the access models, getting to the point where they're coming online, very shortly, um, then it, it will be good to be on the front foot and to take advantage of those. Um, work that Beth did uh, was involved with a few years ago, I guess, with the Access G, now, albeit at a pretty coarse resolution, but the sorts of things that uh, were being generated as experimental output um, that you know, I think I remember being presented at, at AFAC or, or similar forum were things like the probability of getting um, high or very high fire dangers over, over particular parts of the landscape could pretty easily be replicated I think in the in the fire you know in the National Fire Rating System prototype um, by showing areas that have a probability of you know, greater than fifty percent of getting to at least category four or five or six maybe depending on the day. And part of the reason we're doing this very small little case study, I think the biggest challenge in probably is not producing them and probably not even incorporating them into the NFRS. It's actually you, you know, understanding how the decisions have been made for them, so displaying it in the most useful fashion. That's where and that's we need to start having those discussions with them. Um, Simons and Stuart and Henry Sturgis and the authorities on uh, how how that information would be used and what's the best way to uh, display it and incorporate it into the service. Mm -hmm. I haven't kept up with the latest on this project, but do you envisage a system that 
would account for the connectivity of fuel across the landscape and the state of fuel and the forecast wind direction and the sensitive assets. So like essentially like a risk measure as opposed to a fire danger measure. Is that we're heading or is it I know that would need a national fire model to make it work, but is that kind of the intention? Look, yes, in, and, and probably and Stuart in that place for me uh, to answer that but just very briefly. Yeah, certainly well, at least as, as part of some of these other modules. Yeah, so the, the work we've done today has been taking a similar form of the current system and saying if there is a fire in the location and there's something we care about being a person or, or an asset or a plane, what's going to happen to it? Um, one of the next steps for the following years is what's the chance of, chance of the fire starting not being suppressed, travelling to something you've been mentioned and damaging it, um, which is a, a big area problem. Um, so we are going to try and tap into that. Um, we haven't yet really soaked out what the approach is for that. I and mean, some of the stuff that's been done in Victoria and in Phoenix mm -hmm. is certainly a, a promising avenue of answering those kind of questions. Um, also, some good work done by the Uni of Melbourne using data sets to in, include probability in there as well. But it's, it's very much early days. So, do you have I wouldn't mind asking a question from ignorance. <laughs> Your uh, red flag systems, uh, are you looking for red flags at 12 noon the day before or 6 p.m. the day before or 9 a.m. on the day of the, you know, the, the critical situation and does that influence how you develop your, your red flags? <laughs> Yes and no. I guess the red flags are, are integrated over, over the course of the day. So that if, if and, and they're based on this um it's actually out of the air almost of of um what's that? Um of the ten percent of the uh, uh, of the area of the fire weather district meeting whatever criteria it is and, and if the operational system is if, if fire weather warning criteria are met for at least an hour in in the um, in, in a fire weather district, then that district is flagged as as you know as a warning um, district uh, within the system, and, and we kind of use that approach with the red flags, but uh, you know, to, to sort of expand on, on what Claire was saying before, in a sense, the red flags are, are just something that, uh, at the moment at least, are designed to make you look more closely at what's going on. So it may well be that at 9 a.m. and at 10 a.m., but not by 11, 11 a.m., the, um, uh, the red flag criteria are met. So it's, it's more, you know, if you've got a red flag for, you know, for example, you change danger index. Go back and, and, and look at the hourly um, uh, wind change danger index charts and say, oh, okay, at, at 7 p.m. This, this is this is the peak time. This is what we should be looking at. Which which again is it gets back to clear and you know, it's a flag and you go and look at it in detail and you discuss it with the um, with the FAMs or, or with the fire control or just and and oh sorry. I'll, just, just one more thing, very quickly. Um, <coughs> you know, more more work that, that I know Beth's interested in in progressing is you know how do you account for and sorry that was uh, mentioned this morning too is <coughs> how do you incorporate the uncertainty in things like the wind change danger index? Um, you know, how do you how do you incorporate the probabilistic nature of those? Because we saw. For example, this morning that, that there were errors in the, in the model to timing of the wind change that are almost inevitable. Um, and how best to represent those sorts of things is, <coughs> you know, it's, it's kind of an important question to address. Um, <coughs> sorry. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to come back. You probably already thought about this, but a suggestion instead of the probabilistic thing, rather than saying the index is going to be, uh, we, we think the 25 with a 80 percent confidence. What would be more useful, I think, is to say that uh, to 
say that 99% confidence interval might say that it's going to be somewhere between 20 and 40, most likely 25, because they're not necessarily symmetrical relationships. Just to know that that's an 80% chance, you really want to know what that other 20% might be, because yeah. in disasters and emergencies, <laughs> often it says, how extreme could it be, given all the uncertainties involved? So it's not really the probable probability that you're interested in, it's, it's really, you know, what, 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 the, what the range could be, yeah. as you could expect. Yeah. And, and you need to put a number on that, that's where the probability comes in, it might be the 99% chance or a 95% chance, whatever it is. Yeah. So, so representing that spatial thing is, is, is perhaps a challenge. Something that um, <coughs> of evidence of that probability, it seems to me like I'm not really into the interpretive association from a late perspective, but if we continue to talk about the likelihood of all the extreme weather events occurring, then doesn't that create like a knowledge gap between the acknowledgement that the frequency of these events are occurring more regularly? So like, if you continue to say, this, this could result in an extreme event, you're sort of stepping away from saying that like these extreme events are happening with more frequency, which is kind of a result of climate change. So at the same time that you're making the probability of something happen, you're also reducing like the cognitive ability of people to accept that these things are going to become more frequent and more disastrous. Or am I pushing the button too far in the wrong direction? Well, just my, my good thought is that um, there's the kind of different scale of things. Uh, you, you, um, on, on any particular event, you can say, okay, um, we, we expect really bad conditions with this sort of probability, but at another level, um, and, and that's the kind of operational um, focused statement, but at a, at a more uh, more an overview perspective, and, and this is the sort of thing we've seen in, in recent weeks and months, where people are saying, yeah, these things are, uh, are a probable event tomorrow, but yeah, they are becoming more frequent um, as, the, as the baseline, you know, as, as Andrew pointed out this morning, the baseline temperature is increasing, mm -hmm. and, and so they simply become a, a more probable event in general. So I think both messages are, are being put out. You know, it's not an either-or thing. Megan, sorry, go Yeah, thanks. I think jumping back to what Kevin was saying, I mean, the way I see the national financial crisis arena is that it's going to be a lot of But at the moment, we don't have the science to um, communicate that continuum in a numerical sense in the way it's done, that we can with MacArthur, for example, or other things, or like in quantity. So, how do we change things like the wind change index and the sea plains index and the instability index that we've Kevin top that Kevin Tory is doing at the moment with Fire ACB? How do we change those slightly subjective processes that we know about at the moment? a framework or a numerical system or a step in the seed which is going to fit more neatly in the new financial rating system so that it actually can be integrated into part of the system rather than the red flag alongside it. Because I'm quite uncomfortable with this red flag idea because I don't, I'd really like to see these processes that we know are important integrated more thoroughly into the ratings and how do we develop the science, you know, the underpin science that's required to translate what we know now as objective processes into um, some kind of scale. That's what I'd like to see. I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> yeah, uh, another question from a position of ignorance. But the gentleman in the front, uh, some time ago, mentioned one of your aims in this is to try and reduce the number of false alarms. Now, what actually constitutes a false alarm if we say that this is up tomorrow? fire danger to catastrophic. Is it a false alarm if the country is not on fire, or is it a false alarm if the conditions that would have made things disastrous if the Boston vision didn't occur? Yeah, definitely the, the, the latter. If, you know, if the, if the weather conditions <coughs> came to pass, and, and look, 
as, as they do from time to time. You know, there are actually days that are really nasty and nothing happens. Uh, it's certainly not a false alarm, and, and I don't think it'd be flagged to the system. So yeah, a, a, a false alarm would be where we set the rating as, 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 as very high, and we get fires, and they don't go anywhere. So it's, a, 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 and, and the community tells us quite loud and clear when we do that. <laughs> Uh, and particularly where you set tow bands and, and, and you get fires and not a problem. And the misses which are worse is when we, we get surprised and you get fires that are out of control uh, and live days when we have the forecast. And, and we're getting that quite frequently with the current carpet system. So that's what we need to be addressing. So I've been listening to conversations about the five major rates for a while now, but, but I get the sense there's two different conversations going on. There's a fire danger rating system that we use to, to share information with the public. This is what the risk is. And there's information from the fire danger rating system, which is a lot more granular, has more details, has red flags in it, that the agencies will pick up and use. But more often I see those things sort of merging together, that we end up with a little bit of confusion. And I guess I'm interested in, in you know, what Stuart and Simon think about that, but it's, you know, my sense is that, that the power is there for both of them. But when you talk about them in the same breath, it is confusing. Uh, yep, I completely agree. Um, and there's, there's a history of the current system of the same broad messaging being used for both audiences. Although there is some difference in that the calls to action for the community are only set on the higher levels. Um, so at the moment, all the, the products we've produced so far have been agency focused because we've been doing detailed validation work um, meanwhile, the social research um, has, has been going on to work out what will make sense for the public and you know, how many colours and levels and things there are there. Once that work is complete, then I think we probably will end up with two quite sets, two quite distinct sets of messaging. Um, and it's split along the level of detail and the different decisions that people need to make. Um, but it's, it's, it's good to hear that that it sounds confused at the moment. <laughs> and, and when we get some of that social research and we take an effort to, to make clear the, the two different um, ways of communicating, at least to do that. Take a couple, couple more questions, maybe Alan, and, and, then, and, then, um, and then we might swap into Stuart. But, but before we do that, something that, that um, I, I should have mentioned at the start and, and apologise for, for not doing it, that is to to thank Elizabeth Fogel, who's, who's been busily taking notes over there to record the, the outcomes of the conversation. So thank you very much, Elizabeth, who's going to do both sessions for us. So we're really, really grateful for you making an effort to do that. Uh, so, Alan. I think I just want to add on top of Stuart's comments that while there will be two different systems, internally and the external one, the information that will lead to the final figures than the messaging is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. There will be no difference between those two. It's yeah. just how we will display and portray the information back into the agencies or externally. But the purpose of the whole system is to provide better information for managers and for the communities to make decisions. I think, yeah, a, a, a challenge is to get our head around it. And, 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 and I, I think people are in different spaces where we're at as far as the final trade. We've run a prototype. We've got a system that's looking at um, having a whole lot of extra complexity that we need to deal with. Um, we've got a three-year program, basically, to build and implement this system as far as change nationally. And so we're in a quite a critical phase nationally that we need to engage with a lot more with people like you as far as that, that you understand what's happening and, and have an opportunity for this feedback because we're in the build of this system now. Um, as well as the complexity of how we, we, we use eight different vegetation types from two, which hopefully will give us better answers. How do we actually spatially arrange our fire weather areas? Is the 10% rule appropriate? How do you incorporate uh, probabilistic outputs? And then how do you start using um, the, the extra information that can come from these red flags, but fundamentally it's the fire behaviour index that will drive the rating. To come, off up and, to, to come up with a system that's simple enough that people understand it, the decision makers can use it, and make a decision, do I clear a tow man or not, or do I warn and evacuate towns and communities? And so there are some significant outcomes that need to happen as far as how we distill that complexity back down into those decisions. 
Um, probably also worth following that up that we produced a 400 page report and uh, released it because it's been going through a fairly significant um, peer review and hiding that process. Once we're able to get that out, we'll get a lot more information from people we interact with and more than that ever will be stronger. And and most likely workshops on some of these different topics to try and draw things out in a bit more depth over the coming year and years. Great. Yes. yes. Right. Just uh, one, one more question, comment, then we'll just give it a little uh, sort of yeah. just here. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, there's one example I think of from the US, which is Crossabit. I'm not sure if anyone's heard of it, but it's a basically a, a Bayesian framework that they've implemented across the the country can monitor for severe weather hazards in pretty short time frames, actually Chris might know that than I do. But um, it's, it they might be an interesting one to look to because essentially it does take from woods to get puts of basically a power storm occurring that lasts a little while and has been really latched onto um, by you know, several communities in the US. And it might be an interesting case in terms of looking at how people have actually interpreted that um, both from a deterministic and probabilistic book up. Then also the rules will be like over reliance on it, I think that is a risk um, because there's definitely something like that is never going to pick up on, for example, the rapid intensification of a, of a hurricane. Um, so, just a thought there, mate. So, what's the Prop severe. Prop severe? Prop severe. Prop severe. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, thanks. And, and you know, the, that last comment gets back to what Jay said again. You, you need somebody to determine this, this thing rather than just, you know, decide a warning area in some places of which fits the reddest. Yeah, uh, I think part of it also is making sure that we're not losing the knowledge of people like Claire in the process of that, because especially when it's like understanding the conceptual processes and the models you look for, especially if we're starting to think about these things as mesoscale processes, um, that's going to be critical. And the risk is with one of these things that you start to not maintain and pass on. Yeah, yeah. Right, thank you. All right, we, we might leave it there, but I'm just like out of time as it is. Uh, thank you for that. Um, we, we wandered off what, what I had in mind, but that's great. That's the whole point of the exercise to identify things that are important, not necessarily to do what I said out to do. So, um, thank you.